You like corn? You do. I do too. I just love it. The farmers raise the corn. Oh boy! You like I see water. See there? I... Oh, they're frogs. Frogs. That's what they is, isn't it? They really can get in there. What is they? Frogs. Getting an education in Mississippi means more than sitting in a classroom and reading books. It means breaking out of confinement. To explore the world is to go past the pond's edge, over the top of the next hill. Poverty and segregation set limits on the lives of thousands of children in small towns and dusty plantations. A hundred years after the abolition of slavery, poor Negroes are still trapped by traditions in a kind of modern feudalism. Whites own most of the land and almost all business. Work is hard, pay is low, and there are few comforts of living. There are almost as many blacks as whites in Mississippi, but the whites make all the important decisions about taxes and jobs and schools. Education, which should be a way out, only perpetuates the old pattern of exclusion and dependency. Whoa! Oh, sorry. And then Operation Head Start, 
the major educational effort of the war on poverty, began to show what lay beyond these limits. Poor people were to do things for themselves. In the late spring of 1965, parents from 80 communities formed the Child Development Group of Mississippi, CDGM. They got a million and a half dollars from the Office of Economic Opportunity for a summer nursery school program. Each community would organize its own school. Near Durant, people began building their center in the community called Second Pilgrim's Rest. I'm just glad that it's 57 years I've been here. I'm just glad that I live to see some of it. It's, it's better. It's getting better by days, better by days. This used to be my rough state to live in, Mississippi. When I was 15, 16 years old, it was rough, rough, rough in this country. That's right. And we'd go into school. We didn't have no school. We used to go in old houses. Why ever they would let us hold school. That's right. And we would have to go out at recess times with larger children and cut tree roots. Old roots would grow up out of the ground and the little sprigs like that for wood is to keep heat. And I had to walk 10 miles a day to school. 10 miles, five going and five back. Country churches were fitted out as schools. They were the only public buildings the Negro communities owned. Parents themselves hired local people as teachers. CDGM sent in young professional educators to offer training and advice. The chairman of the center at Second Pilgrim's Rest was Mrs. Saffold, who had picked cotton and done housework until she got interested in the freedom movement. You're the chairman. Well, how did you decide to take such an active part in the program? Well, when I began to start working for the FDP and I began to read the papers a little more, began to look at notice television, the news a little more, and I began to listen in and take, it began to take effect on me about what a different one would be saying about uneducated, different you know, white people. Different white peoples in the news, you know, in the, on television about the uneducated, nasty, stinking Negroes. And then I began to think, and working for the FDP too, I began to think about uh, if I didn't turn and stop now and think about my own children, they would be called the same thing that I was called. Just before the CDGM Head Start centers opened, parents, teachers, and staff workers met on the old Negro College campus at Mount Beulah to talk about the summer's work. Organizers have been preparing the communities for Head Start all spring. We are trying to set a program up for all the community, to represent the community, to be designed by the community and with the community people. By that I mean the people in poverty. We don't believe in having people that are out of poverty. The people that are in the rural areas are the people that need it. So that's why we are carrying it to them. And we will give them all the details of the poverty program. Being in charge was a difficult new experience. The first director of CDGM, Tom Levin, knew there were differences and doubts among the parents. Our project, the Child Development Group of Mississippi, will show that people in their own communities don't need somebody on top. We don't need people to cut off the cream we don't need people to come say, you come to the back door and I'll pass out a little bit to you. We can run our own projects. Now, and I want to know what you people... Few of the parents had ever been able to take part in the education of their children. They lacked the self-confidence as well as the political power to have influence in the schools. It was hard for them to believe that untrained people could be qualified to teach. I mean, this uh, Head Start project consists of somebody that has B.S. degrees to work with the children or somebody that who really knows the kids. We have room for both kinds of people. I disagree with that. If I want my child to, to be taught, let it be somebody who is qualified to teach the child. And the beginning of the little three and four and five-year-old, well, that is the, the beginning of those stages. 
and somebody who is qualified, and somebody who is going to even speak right around your children, try to give your child the right foundation, well, those are the people I think should be in charge of the children. There is people who have walked the street, have been to these homes. They resented Negro teachers who worked for white school boards and would not help organize CDGM. When the teachers would say, hey, no man, there's nothing to it. All right, but when it was uh, rumored some way that there was $150 involved for uh, professional teachers, that's when they all got interested. We all are in, I say, financial trouble somewhere. And there be, may be a lot of us sitting here right now who are parents, who are in it for money also. So you can't just look at it as teachers in it for money. We are all in it for money. We are just getting way off the subject. Who's qualified? Yes, there are parents who are as qualified as a professional teacher. Who's qualified? The person who has the child at heart will make the best teacher. The person who knows, who has thought about this child, who has worked with children in many areas, who have worked with them either in um, your ch churches or Sunday school groups or places. These will be the most qualified people. Uh, those people who, have, who deal with children in more areas than they're in school. They can also qualify. They are qualified. And I just think that we were just using a lot of time to say much of nothing. And I like to try to take some of the edge off of the, the fight between the teachers and the Mississippi people. Now, one of the things that the child of one of that group of Mississippi says, by the way, one of the qualifications for working for this group is that you've got to obey the law of the country. And that is that there are no more segregated facilities in this state according to the law of the United States of America, and no kid. No kid in the preschool program for the child development group of Mississippi had ever be taken into a back door by anybody that works for us. We ain't raising no children to be second class citizens and Uncle Tom. Now the other thing is that we're using integrated school books, you know, with little black children and little white children in there together. And the reason for that is what you teach a first grade kid when you give when you let him look into those little books with nothing in there but white kids with straight hair and long noses and white features is that they've got to be white if they want to be equal to those little children. And they can't get white. So what you're really telling them is that they won't ever be equal to those kids. That's what you're telling them. So that the day of the segregated school book in Mississippi is ended, baby. And Mississippi don't like that, see, because when you start telling little five-year-old children that they're equal to little five-year-old white kids, they grow up believing that. And then they become what this state calls uppity niggas. And you know they don't like that. Oh, this little light of mine, Lord, I'm going to let it shine. Tom Levin, the first director of CDGM, is a New York psychologist who had worked in the freedom schools of the civil rights movement. The primary need for Negro education in Mississippi, and I say Negro education, is not integration, but the ability for the child and the community to experience a common goal, which is an alteration in their economic, social, and political status in Mississippi. The Negro people or to ever realize a sense of their own value and find a, an avenue for it. From the beginning, one of the things they must protect is the most precious commodity, their children. They have to have the responsibility of educating their children, both for the child's sake and the community's sake. And one of the first things we have to address ourselves to is what we consider qualified. Now, qualified in terms of credential state licenses and education are an important consideration for a middle-class northern community. But if we're to use the same concept of qualified 
in translating it to the Mississippi poor communities, we would effectively disenfranchise the entire community from any role in running its program, planning its program, and from the ultimate responsibilities involved in the program. We would be perpetuating a complete second-class citizenship. So we ask ourselves, is it quali qualifications we're interested in, or is it quality? I think we have people within our community who have a quality which no amount of academic credential can match. They have roots in the community, they have an understanding of the problem, they can communicate with the people that we're going to be working with and with the children, and perhaps most important, they're not going to have the problem of an outside white professional of essentially communicating to the people of Mississippi their ineffectuality, uh, their uh, lack of training, and essentially their lack of worth to run this. I think this program must be run by people of the communities. And I think they will do it excellently. Does everyone know this one? There was a week of teacher training. It wasn't all lecture and theory. My little dog was playing one day. Dog, dog, tick, dog, 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 dog. Either you can make either words you d decide to say. You can say dog, 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 dog. All right. Can we get? My little dog was playing one day, dog, 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 down in the meadow by the bell of a hay, dog, dog, tick, cock, dog, dog. Oh, see, that's it, that's it. It's really good if you can get it together. Let's try it again. Then we should think in terms of methods, means on how to really give the preschool age a head start. First of all, we said a child must be kept happy. If you can keep a child happy, you can get him at his very best. No one was an expert. Parents and staff learn from each other. They want to do something all day, but if they don't take a part, you know, they never really learn. You learn to do by doing. Let's do what we did when we were four and five and six. Let's make pretty designs and towers and garages and barbecue pits and... This is chicken coop. We are used to make chicken coop when I was a child. This must be like a chicken coop by the sea. <laughs> That's the way I made it when I was a child. Now let's think about things that people made. Maggie, what are you making? I'm making things, like things in order. order. Things in order. She's making things in order. Yeah. Any other kinds of order that you discovered within the rocks? One purple. <laughs> Ten white equal one orange. One yellow, one red, and one white make one brown equal one brown. What are we doing, people? Adding, adding. adding. One plus two plus two plus one. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, All summer long, in the hot, bright mornings of the Mississippi Delta, the children of Durant gathered at the Head Start Center in Second Pilgrim's Rest, the school their parents had built. There were 45 of them, from three to six years old, and all of them were black. The whites would not come. The teachers and their aides were the women of Durant. None of them were trained. All of them were poor and needed jobs. Shirley, Vanessa, Hartley. I'm going to play a game. How many boys do you have here? Three. On hand to offer their skills were a few experienced teachers like Doris Derby. Is that the same as this? Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is it the same as this? No. What number is this? No. no I do. Is this number the same as Hattie this? Hattie Saffold was the head teacher. Hattie's going to do the next one. Oh, 
Making a game out of numbers was new to Mrs. Saffold, but she needed no training to understand the neighborhood children. Play in a schoolroom was another new idea. Before Head Start, playing house meant fooling with tin cans and corn cobs. Yeah, I'm gonna have a little house. Now we making a big house, please. Oh, a big house? Where is your, where is your back? Where is the back of your house? Yeah, there it is. Oh, but well, where is your step? Yeah, the step. I'm talking about, you say you had step to the back? Where is your, where is your step to the back? The teachers were struck with the same sense of delight. The toys were new to everybody, and the excitement of discovery was contagious. Six-year-olds discovered building blocks and raced through years of development. many ways for Negro children in Durant to express themselves freely. Schools and parents and traditions demand obedience and conformity and everybody in their place. As the teachers began to understand the possibilities of a new kind of education, they challenged the rules of a closed society. Now there were warm smiles and praise for every sign of creativity and achievement. Look at me. Oh, that's nice. That's real nice. What is that? Look at that, Miss Ed. What is that? He's just a monster. Great. Yes, coming at you. You're snaking. Look at that head. Come on at you now. Oh, come on, it's kind of long. Look, you got to shape it. Miss Ed, look. i tell you what. I want all of you to make me a bowl. I believe I want Terry, Miss Ed, Carol Ann to put me three one. eggs in the bowl. Look at my bowl. Look at my bowl. But now, this is a nursery school, and this is a new type of nursery school. And we're doing a lot of new things and trying out uh, so many new ideas. And I, I'd like to see if we can think of some new ways in which we could discipline the children that might be other than using just even the thread of a switch. Now, Mrs. Glover mentioned a couple. For example, letting the child stand on one foot or... or in schools and homes all over the South, the switch is an easy shortcut to respect and obedience. The teachers were reluctant to give it up, but the goal of the Child Development Group of Mississippi was freedom, not conformity. And maybe they'll do some bad things. Mischief was a minor problem. Teachers wanted the children to settle their own squabbles and to learn to stick up for themselves. The 
real problem wasn't disobedience, but withdrawal. Like the society around her, Orma Jean was passive, distracted, fearful. Sometimes the difference between a listless and an energetic child was a case of worms. Most of the children had never had a medical examination. What's in there, Lola? Meat, huh? <laughs> Take a deep breath, Lola. Deep breath. Once again. Only a few doctors would make house calls or extend credit, and the local clinic was intimidating to the parents. It just seems to be wonderful. You have so many singers. Holly Greenberg was program director on the central staff of CDGM. She tried to help all 84 centers to run smoothly. You seem to enjoy the music a lot. That's why they enjoy it a lot. <laughs> is there any place, is there any way that you could fix a book corner someplace where you could have like a rug or some cushions or some chairs or some blocks or a bench or anything where they could sit and have all the books kept out on, on some low table or something. I know you don't have enough tables, but maybe even a table made out of boxes. Well, I, I don't know whether you could see it or not, and I was putting the name on different boxes on which the toys was in. If it was puzzles, oh. you know, right on their puzzles, and we could set them on low shelves. So when the kids get ready to play with them, they know they can go to the puzzle box and we'll have to pull all of the things oh, out. Wouldn't that be and right now it is hard from the moving. It's hard it to is. find things. They're kind of it is. The schoolroom gradually took shape as teachers picked up good suggestions and learned from their own experience. They built a dollhouse, organized the equipment, and arranged a library corner. The little doll flipped up, flipped up, and the other little doll was in the window. This the was a wonderful place to hide in, says Cadell. Well, what's this? Do you know what these are? You know what you were doing this morning? What is this? Do you know? He don't know. You know. What is it? Apples. Apples? Yes. I hate that way. Oh. Now, what's your name? What does that say? It says Ronnie. Can you read that? What does that say? Lie. Look at it. What does it say? Lie. Your name is Jerry Hill? Community begins with a sense of identity. Let's try your name. This is your name. This is your name. And then respect for family. and then a pride in the richness of the race. CDGM was not afraid to celebrate blackness. Children played with Negro magazines and helped make their own books. Mama told me to tell you to be one hammer like you see me do. To be one hammer like you see me do. My mama told me to tell you to be two hammers like you see me do. To be two hammer like you see me do. My mama told me to tell you to be three hammer like you see me do. 
the big three have a like the three mini do. My mom. The language and lore of the community was the material of education. At school and at home, there was a shared standard of values. <laughs> The children and the teachers had to love their world of Durant. Love it enough to want to make it better. As the program developed, so did white hostility. Not far from Durant, the Valewood Center was burned to the ground. Anyone that do that, I don't care who he is, white or black, if he do that, he'll dig the dead up out of the grave. I don't know where the people come from. They got that in their heart. I don't know where they come from. But they haven't got a heart. They got a rock. And if they don't get better, we're going to move them out. That's a certain fact. You see what I mean? Four years' time, if these bad offices don't get better with these Negro people, we can vote them out because there's going to be enough for us to do it. That's right. And if we can't stop this now, we'll let it go in the next three years. We'll have it like we want it. If they be nice, we put them back. Though it's nice. If you mean, we just, if you need nasty and mean, we just going to keep you out. And we can do it. That's right. We have some more workers. We have a health association worker here. Within their own center, at least, parents felt secure. But the children would integrate the white school in the fall, and the grown-ups were anxious. To the white school this year, you, as the mother or legal guardian, must take the child to the school. And when you do, you must have a, a health record or an immunization record. Any, anyone who hasn't, doesn't have these things and would like to have them I'm available right they discussed now. whether the children were ready. I would like to know, um, do you feel that the children are learning anything? And who's, uh, what, you, what child do you have here? Uh, and what does he tell you about the center? Well, since she's been going to school, she acts more mature, more grown up than she did before. You don't like talking to me about different things and asking me, do I know this? And, like they have songs, I guess they sing them in class or in the school, and she'll start off on songs, and sometimes I remember that I have had those same songs when I was going to school. And we'll sing them together, and just everything. It's, uh, oh, he's ready every day, something says. Oh, he never knows the difference. And he always wants to go to school, and he always notices the people that He's out here to the center. He watches those who come by the streets, and he knows them, and he's off a friendly with them. And I think he's learning, have changed a great deal from what he was. Now, as you all know, we have a kitchen back there, and we need many, many things to complete our kitchen. 
which we don't have. And we, want, we would like for each and everybody to give us something to complete our kitchen. Despite and growing tension with the white community, the center became more and more active. We started to put this sheet rock up in here, and we, gonna, we, we want y'all to come. Just, just come on out. Here's all out. It ain't just one man. It's everybody. Whole families were drawn into the life of the centers. Older brothers and sisters played with the younger ones, and fathers came in from the fields or took time from work to be with the children. All right, that's your mule now, and you and my mule. Let's go. Get up here, mule. Get up. Get up. Come up, mule. You ain't nothing but the mule. They helped with moving equipment and hauling water and carpentry and sewing. Most of them got no pay, but the chores weren't make work. The school really counted. It was in the middle of their lives. But the white opposition was determined to stop CDGM's progress. The burnings and the shootings and the harassment got worse. And I really was excited when I see it, because of course I always look out there when I go by there, you know. But I wasn't expecting it to see no fire, but I did. So then I hit my brakes and I started to stop, and then something come to me and said, well, maybe they'll trap me, you know. Maybe somebody will be there and maybe, you know, harm us. I'm in a minute, so. Uh, I, Told her, I said, well, let's go get some help. It was just smoking. Smoke was everywhere. They probably were just starting when I, we, I drove up. They probably were there somewhere then and saw the car and stepped in the woods because... Local I police quick, weren't interested. Was to, you know, a law student on the CDGM central staff came down the next day to get the facts and offer advice. Now, you were there guarding the place at the time, That's right? right. After, you were, after they arrived, you left. Is that or did you stay there? I stayed there. That's right. And what were the things he said when he threatened you? Uh, he told me, say, you better make sure who you, uh, who you turn against. That, that, that's my, that is my brother, something like that. Brother-in-law. Brother-in-law. It's my brother-in-law. Say, it's going to be a killing here if you're not sure what he said. And he, better make sure and, who you turn against? That's right. And he, and he waved his gun at me. He's trying to make his mind whether he shoot me or not. And he look at Clam Sam, they go for you too. Who is it who called the FBI? Uh, Fitz. Fitz and someone else. Now, but it's not going to do to have that place empty again because they're going to burn it down right away. Oh, well, it won't be empty anymore. You have guns here too, don't you? That's right. <laughs> As parents taught children about their traditions, they went deeper toward their roots themselves. The Mississippi Delta has its own flavors and sounds, and the community built a folk festival around them. There was nostalgia even about the bitter years of slavery. Head Start, as part of the war on poverty, was meant to move communities to action. I think also that it's teachers' job to encourage different community action projects, um, such as, uh, you know, helping around here building to build things, and whatever the other things that are going on in the area, educational, social, political, or whatever the other things are, that will help develop the child. If things affect the parents, 
and the parents don't do anything about it, it's certainly going to affect the child. Well, I think, uh, well, I know you is right, because uh, if we expect him to have a better prospect in what we're trying to do, get our rights, uh, fighting for our rights, we're going to have to teach and tell everybody to cooperate and not just tell them to cooperate and not cooperate ourselves. Although uh, we might get tired on the way, but it's just a job that you can't turn back. You have to keep on working. If you're expecting to get something out of it, you got to keep on working until you reach your goal on it. Now, there are so many more programs that you can have besides the school. Would any of you all have any suggestion of any type of program that you would wish to be here? Parents talked about other forms of government help. Before CDGM, they hadn't even known the possibilities. There came a time now that it can be better, but you've got to speak for yourself. Tell everybody what you want. The white people, the black people, and Phil Gerbic, and everybody, just tell them what you want. Uh, if I wanted a good job, I'd just tell them, I want a job. Job is all right in its place. But you don't want to be a, a, just a white ox all your life. You want to get a job and then uh, vesticate your own into something to make money. Go into some kind of business. See, then you begin somewhere. Just a job. You just you you don't want to be that all the time. You want to improve. They are also asking for a sewing center. At the end of the summer, representatives from all the child development centers came back to Mount Beulah to talk about the future of the program. I am J.C. Johnson from Greenville District 2, and I will speak for the rest of the centers there also. It's not many things that we need, but we like the continuation of the, of the program. We need adult classes, parliament buildings, and sewing centers, and training schools for some of the adults that need our jobs. We also need doctors there. We do not have doctors. We need people there that will take care of these people without so much money. Some families in our neighborhood right now, they're very, very sick. They have very big problems. But they are not able to take care of these problems because they're not able to. But still, their children are suffering. We need sewing projects there that will benefit the poor people there, too. We need so many things there. So many things. If we get some of the things we need, I'm sure that the community will help out with the rest. I think what we need is some housing bill. And I understand that is a way that they can be gotten for those people. We get more cooperation out to people, but a lot of them, they are afraid of the, the job. They are Not just the jobs were being threatened. CDGM was proving that poor Negroes could run a school system and could manage their own affairs. The experience was deeply unsettling to white Mississippi. It attacked the assumptions of racists who could not believe that Negroes were qualified citizens and it undermined the interests of many gradualists who still treated Negroes like children. The black community at the bottom of the pyramid of power was on the move. Down the same streets in the same towns lived the whites who had no trouble making themselves heard. Charges began to reach OEO headquarters in Washington of bad bookkeeping, misuse of funds for civil rights activities, unprofessional standards, and separatism. CDGM funds were held up for five months while the program was investigated, the books were audited, and the political problems were weighed. Finally, the money came through for a second expanded summer program. And then suddenly, when it was over, all funds were cut off. The supporters of CDGM bitterly accused OEO officials of killing the program to appease political pressures, a charge they denied. Jewel Sugarman of the OEO had helped set up CDGM, had watched over its administration and tried to resolve its problems. Not only Mr. Shriver, but the entire OEO staff feel that there have been substantial contributions made by the program. But in general, we've uh, we found a repetition of the same kinds of problems that we experienced uh, during the first grant. Uh, and that is uh, particularly in the uh, misuse of funds, uh, the some degree of sloppiness in uh, accounting uh, and uh, control of funds and recording of the purposes uh, for which they were used. 
And in New York, Kenneth Clark, the educator and psychologist, joined a National Citizens Committee that also looked into CDGM and published a report that dismissed these charges. It appears to me that to argue that uh, CDGM cannot be refunded or should not be refunded because of fiscal responsibilities is a rather uh, superficial and uh, sophistry-like type of argument. I mean, uh, yes, fiscal, fiscal problems exist, but they can be handled. The other criteria should determine whether a program is refunded or not, particularly when the fiscal problems can be remedied. My general feeling is that uh, it is not a good idea to encourage the development of separatist Negro organizations, uh, even though I would acknowledge that this will provide valuable experience uh, in responsibility and procedure which would be useful in, in dealing with other organizations. It is perfectly clear to me and to anyone who knows the CDGM picture that uh, white children were not excluded. Again, let me emphasize that this is not a program for Negroes. It's a program for all of the people of Mississippi. The fact of the matter is that uh, in communities like Boston, New York, uh, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, the anti-poverty programs are perceived by the white community as being for Negroes, and poor whites who are eligible generally do not uh, participate. And if this is true throughout the country, it would seem to me that uh, it would be obvious that it would be true even more so in Mississippi. Uh, I think that there has not been uh, any significant gain in the willingness of local uh, community organizations um, particularly the official agencies of government uh, to be involved in relationship to the Negro communities, at least in the context of CDGM. I think, from my study of uh, anti-poverty programs, one can almost predict the extent or degree of potential success of a program by the amount of antagonism which that program generates from the political establishment. We. Uh, I think uh, take second place to no one in our admiration for what can be done by non-professionals in these kinds of programs. But at the same time, well, we have the definite feeling that there is a need for professional leadership and, and supervision and training of the non-professional. And uh, increasingly, I had the feeling that the local communities were not receptive to that kind of participation and that the board of CDGM was not willing and, and able to enforce its, uh, uh, its policies that there should be such participation. CDGM had a staff that came in, set up uh, CDGM programs throughout Mississippi. What is clear, however, is that that staff was probably more successful than any other staff in any other anti-poverty program in this country in realistically and genuinely involving the people of Mississippi themselves in the day-to-day -day running of that program. This would seem to me to have been the goal of the anti-poverty program. And CDGM has demonstrated that that goal is achievable. The campaign to save CDGM began with a mass meeting in Jackson, Mississippi. Government officials were rapidly funding alternative head starts. White school boards and welfare agencies were often in charge of the new programs. Hattie Saffold came down from Durant to tell how much trouble she was having with the new program there. Practically all I know, I have attended quite a few CAP meetings, and they don't, well, the managers there, the uh, white power structures, they won't give us the opportunity to even speak. And what they're saying is that we fighting that, you know, their CAP school, the CAP are not fighting the CDGM school. So I don't know, uh, but every time one of us get up to say something, they say, well, you don't have no voice, you don't have no right to say anything. I said CDGM, oh yeah, I represent the poor people, oh yeah, I said the poor people, oh yeah, of Mississippi. Oh, yeah. I said we're going to fight for it. Oh, yeah. I said we're going to fight for it. Oh, yeah. We're going to 
gonna fight all day. Oh yeah. And we'll never get tired. Oh no. We gotta walk that walk. Oh yeah. We One of the alternative Head Start programs, the largest, was chartered by three politically powerful figures, a moderate newspaper editor, an industrialist, and a plantation owner, all white. There are 12 members of the board of directors. Only four of them are black, and they are middle-class moderates. The governor of Mississippi has endorsed this program. There are no poor Negroes and no militant civil rights leaders making policy. There have been talk going around the state that CDGM is dead. And when I see all of these people, I know CDGM is not dead. The Reverend McCree is chairman of the CDGM board of directors. OEO had led us to believe that we would be funded without very many problems. Then a deal is made which was politically inspired. And they never had the courtesy to even tell us about the announcement. And then after he had announced it in the press, a letter was read to us from Mr. Shriver by telephone from out of the state. And this is the kind of thing that we just ain't going to have anymore. Let us show them today, and let us show Washington, let us show OEO, that we people in Mississippi, we black people in Mississippi are together and we are not going to be sold one by one. No. Other things you're gonna to have to ask OEO. And you know when we put in our last proposal, we waited four months, five months before we could get refunded. Now yesterday I was told that up there at Russ College they haven't even submitted an application and been given a million three hundred thousand dollars. Now we need to ask OEO how these other cap boards this week could get funded in a few hours. And we've been struggling for weeks and stayed away. Marion Wright is one of the few Negro members of the Mississippi Bar and a founding director of CDGM. And if there isn't a political deal involved here, let them prove it. Sergeant Schreiber himself a couple months ago said this was the best program in the nation and what we're gonna have to ask him is how that changed all of a sudden. The problem that was wrong with this program is that you were too good. And the problem that was wrong with this program is that all of a sudden Negroes found out that they could run things as well and better than white folks could run them for them. That as we look across the United States at all the... Richard Boone is a former OEO Director of Community Action. This program stands out as about the only big program in which poor people have and must continue to have the chance to help themselves out of poverty. Support from labor groups, churchmen, and independent citizens was coming in from all parts of the country. Even at the OEO offices in Washington, staff members signed a petition to save CDGM. Your program is a great example of an effort of a people to move beyond all this into basic programs to help themselves. We want you people to stand up and speak and let OEO and everybody else know we ain't turning around. And if this uh, cap takes over, then our people will be without work or anything to do. They'll all be employed by professional people. We feel like the professional people is already in position to get jobs and whatnot. But we want to try to help the, the people that's on the common level. Because they won't hire them. 
the who they are hiding now at these factories and the places, the ones that haven't taken no part and no movement and no nothing, and the ones that brought it, they, and the ones that, uh, and the ones that hadn't did anything but sit back and criticize, them, the ones has got the job. I think that something is happening here that the poor people of Mississippi, and when I say poor people, I do not refer only to the poor colored people, but the poor people of Mississippi cannot afford to have. And that is if people can, can stay, sit down and pick for you, the people who will represent you, then those people can pick any person they choose. See, I want people to think about struggling and controlling your own program and running it the best you can because you ain't never had a chance to run nothing in your life. We don't need the Mr. Charlie to operate CDGM for us. We've done it and we can do it again. And we are going to do it again. And we ain't going to let nobody, but I mean nobody. Nobody ain't going to pick out five or six Tom that's going to sit there and you can see the wisdom teeth first because he's grinning. Fannie Lou Hamer brought the enormous energy of the civil rights movement to the fight for CDGM. The first thing you see is his wisdom tooth and he's getting ready to say, yes, sir. <laughs> You know something, I'm not disgusted. I feel, I feel better than I felt in a long time. Cause all of these people here, we got to do something, honey. And we've been down so long, we ain't got no other way to go but up. The people from Harlem said, baby, said, tell us when you want us to come. The people in Watts said, honey, we coming. Because the town's been using us too. The Citizens for Progress in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania yeah. said, baby, we all the way with you. Yeah. And we got to let people know how we feel. We are not satisfied because we know this poverty program, if these politicians handle it with the few towns that they got picked out, We'll be in a worse shape, people, in the next two years than we've ever been in in our lives. We are not going to have it. We're going to fight for what means something to us. So now we're ready to tell it because, you see, we want people all over America to know that we're fighting on a principle. And we're going to say... And we're going to say now... Go and tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go and tell it on the mountain to let my people go. Now everybody sang that, you know it. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain to let my people go. The struggle went on for another two months. Finally, just before Christmas, the OEO compromised. A reduced CDGM program was funded for another year. Poor blacks in Mississippi have won more than a grant. They have won a share in the power that others have had for themselves.
is NET, the National Educational Television Network.